Bob, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and uh, take it away. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be anywhere, right? Right? Most of you. Um, I had a uh, heart transplant uh, 21 and a half months ago. And um, I'm, well, you'll see, I'm actually doing pretty good. Uh, Damn I'm, good. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. Um, I, I never, never had a heart attack. Um, my arteries were clear. I did all the things you're supposed to do to not have a heart attack, and I'll explain a little bit about why uh, and, as I go through this. And and but I uh, I became victim of a disease, uh, an autoimmune disease called sarcoidosis. And in the scheme of things, fortunately, it only affected my heart, and because it can affect any organ in your body, and in my case, it, again. Luckily, it was just just my heart, and so my kidneys <coughs> are fine, and my lungs are fine, and my pancreas is fine. Blah 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 blah. All that other stuff is is fine, and um, I believe that I have I prepared myself for this, uh, and it started as a kid. I I really do, and that's why I say there are. There are reasons for everything, and 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 uh, I really do believe that, and hopefully you'll you'll get a sense of that as we go through this, and you know we've all heard this phrase before, you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and in, in fact it's from Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, you know a very well known 19th century philosopher, and and I, I firmly believe that um, we all gone through our versions of of this and. Oftentimes in some very minor ways, and and often and sometimes in some not so minor ways, some rather significant ways. So that's kind of the backdrop for this, in some respects. But the the reality is is that is that these are really the main reasons why um, uh, I'm standing here and can stand here. That's that's my wife. On the on the right, uh, Patty. We've been married for 38 years, and and she's just an amazing, amazing character, who who works way more than I do, um, and so she's exhausted, which is part of the reason she's not here today. Uh, and that's our our daughter Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie is a, a recent uh, grad from NYU and is looking for a job. If anybody knows of anything, what's her major? Her major was in food studies and then marketing and tel and communications and, and that sort of thing. And, and so she really wants to follow mom in her footsteps, which is my wife has an MBA in marketing and has worked for companies like Campbell Soup. And, and she was VP of marketing at Whitman's Chocolates and, and she's done some really very high level kinds of things and has done an awful lot in, in, in turning around products. And right now she's got a new assignment in a baby food company. Um, your wife or your daughter? My wife does, yeah. I mean, actually, daughter, my daughter I'm sorry, because I, I went mentally through my role decks. Does your daughter want to work specifically in food? Not necessarily, but sure. Talk to me after this. So. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll be happy to. Thank you. So, but these these are the two guys. These, this is it. I mean, to me, there is nothing else. You know, I, and I, 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 you know, I had I had to stay here for for both of them, for that matter. Although she was looking for the, I think she was looking for the, for the uh, life insurance maybe. Uh, no, that's clearly a joke. But I had to be here. There's just too many things, there's too many experiences that I didn't have yet. And um, so my journey starts back in the 50s when I was born. And, and uh, you know, I loved baseball and I became a swimmer. That's about the best I can do. <laughs> I, be I became a pretty competitive swimmer back in the 50s and it extended into the 60s as well. And of course, I started school. Uh, big baseball fan, like I said, um, the, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Dodgers, because I grew up in North Jersey and everybody's from New York. And, uh, but there's a heart in the middle of that. And the heart in the middle of that is uh, uh, my, my father's uh, brother one of them anyway, uh, died of heart disease when I was about two. I don't remember him, but I know that's true. Uh, and my, my other uncle uh, had another brother of my, father, of my dad, uh, had a couple heart attacks in the 50s, and my dad had probably three of them. 
in the 50s. So that helped to somehow form my thinking. Then in the 60s, um, this is the world turned upside down. And you guys, you don't, but you guys, maybe you do a little bit. You guys remember the 60s. The 60s was really crazy. It was wonderful how crazy it was. But the world was turned upside down. Um, and my dad wore one of those hats. And he died in, in, uh, after having ultimately seven heart attacks. Uh, he died in 1964, uh, about a month and a half after uh, Jack Kennedy was shot, which is one of the reasons the world was turned upside down. Um, as you all recall, Bad Pigs, Jack Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, Vietnam War, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and I, I graduated high school in the 60s. At the end of the 60s, but in the 60s. So that's what that's about. And I also became very, very athletic. And I've been athletic my entire life. And so that, those, are, those are real trophies I earned from, from the, the, the uh, from the very early 60s, mid 60s, from bowling and basketball and, and swimming and all kinds of stuff. So, um, and and then and then the 70s came. And what happened in the 70s? Well, I graduated from high school in the 60s. I went to to college and I graduated from college. And then I further graduated from graduate school. Um, and and ultimately we got married. And so I started making some money somewhere along the way. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And I, somebody told me I had to, to start running. And I'll tell you about that as well. Um, my career has been in the healthcare business. Um, the, I, prob I guess in the 60s, I, I went to work at 17 at a drugstore doing uh, deliveries and, and, and stock boy and all that sort of stuff. And, I kind of liked it, and I, and I went to, to school. And when I when I finished uh, graduate school, I was interested in healthcare. I took a job at a hospital in northern New Jersey called St. Barnabas Medical Center uh, as a clerk on a nursing unit, and thought I was going to only be there for a couple of months over the summer because I was supposed to. I started graduate school at NYU in the fall, and in another discipline, <clears throat> and and but I fell in love with being in that environment. And, so I ended up in, in just one semester part time at NYU and decided to switch, and, and end up I ended up with an MBA in, in, in healthcare administration. So I started my career in hospital administration back in those days, and I stayed there um, at St. Barnabas through uh, through early early '79. Uh, but in the last two years that I was there, I had a three part job um, postgraduate school. I was the administrator for the Department of Surgery. Uh, the, uh, I opened up, I was the first administrator for St. Barnabas' Burn Center, and then I also was the administrator for the dialysis and the kidney transplant program, of, of all things. Who, who knew? Um, and, and so, it, it, I, things were just developing in, in, for me, in, in, as it, I think ultimately as it relates to what, what we've had to deal with over the last several years, uh, personally. Um, and in early, uh, late 78, and, and then ultimately in early 79, I came to work at Albert Einstein Medical Center here in Philadelphia. Um, and ultimately in 1980, we moved down here, but it, it, I, went, I worked at the Daroff Division, the Mount Sinai Division at Fifth and Reed Streets, uh, initially, and, uh, and, and had a wonderful time there. That hospital, as any of you may recall, if you you're familiar with it? I was born yeah. there. You were born there, okay. Well, you know. <laughs> well, that, was, that hospital was, a, was, and I, you know, I was 27 years old. I didn't understand this. That hospital was a turnaround. It was not doing well when I got there. And I sort of knew that, but I never heard of the phrase turnaround. I didn't know what that meant. And, and yet, I was part of the team, and we turned it around, and we did really, really well there. That ultimately went away, unfortunately. But in the years I was there, we turned it around. And, and I had a boss who had recovered from thyroid cancer, and, but he was a runner. And he said to me one day, I was probably about 185, 190 pounds, which is, for this little body isn't a lot. And he said to me, this is in 79, he said, we're sponsoring a 5K race. And I said, that's great, what's that? 
And he said, oh, and he told me. And, and he said, it's down in Roosevelt Park in South Philly. And I said, I'll be happy to be there. He said, no, no, you're going to run. I said, I don't think so. He said, oh, yeah, you're going to run. So, you know, when your boss tells you what you can do, so you do it. And so I ran this sort of, I ran this first race, and it was miserable. It was miserable. But, you know what? It's sort of interesting at the same time. And, and uh, in, in the 80s, a uh, few things happened. I got a chance to, I, I, I left uh, South Philadelphia, and I went to Einstein in North Philadelphia. And uh, so that was kind of the in and out over there. And uh, started to make a little more money. That's kind of where the little thing is there. And, and there were some other things I did in the 80s that I'll tell you about as well in terms of that. But I also started realizing that I needed to eat a little healthier. And so, yeah, I had a whole bunch of these, but I started doing more of, of, uh, of some of the healthier foods at the same time. Um, but in, in, 19, in 1981, um, I, had a, uh, I had to have some teeth taken out of my mouth. And so I chose to have it all done at one time because that's just the way it is. I didn't want to extend the, the pain. And in the two weeks post-surgery, I lost 15 pounds. And, and I had already gone down to 175. So now here I am at 160, and I go out for a run about a week and a half, you know, right after all of that. And I said, wow, this is, this is great. This is this new body running, and it feels wonderful. And in 1981, I ran my first half marathon here in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, it was an amazing experience. And I've run that particular race now 18 times. I've run 24 half marathons altogether. And I'll be running the, uh, what the, the successor race to that which is now called the Rock and Roll Half Marathon, at the end of October. I'll be doing that at the end of October this year. Like, you know, six weeks. Impressive. And, and so, <coughs> so that, that, that started a very material journey for me. In addition to that, um, uh, I started in 1984. I ran a, I actually ran a marathon. A full marathon. Except, you know what? I didn't finish. It was here in Philadelphia, and I sort of uh, pooped out at 17 miles, and but somehow I kept going. And at 22 miles, this little trolley car came by to pick up the near dead, and I was one of those. And so I got on the trolley car, so I didn't finish. And most people would say, "That was horrible. I'm never going to do that again." No, 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 not me. I said, "Are you kidding me?" I didn't train well for that, and I was angry. Next year, 85, I ran the Philadelphia uh, Marathon, and I did it really well. And I ran it in about three hours and 35, 36 minutes or something like that. And, in, and, and then in 1986, um, I ran the New York Marathon. And in 1987, I ran the New York Marathon. Uh, oh no, it was 87, 88, and 89. Yeah, 87, 88, and 89 I ran New York. So I ran marathons, almost finishing the first one, from 85 through 89. And then I took a break, and then in the, and I ran my last marathon in 1991. Um, and I ran it in 325, which is pretty, pretty good. I missed qualifying for Boston, which my wife was very happy about. <laughs> then I would have had to train over the winter and because I, I would have run Boston in the spring, of course. But I didn't do it. So those are, those are my medals. Those are real. Um, and, uh, you know, but like I said, I didn't, I didn't finish the first one. But I didn't give up. I said, mm, this has got to work. So, and then the 1990s came. I finished, I did my, I, I did, uh, I, as I said, I, I, I did one more marathon, and I still did a whole bunch of half marathons through, through the 90s. I've done a whole bunch more in the 80s as well. And, and, and I, you know, changed, changed jobs a couple of times. Uh, uh, 
left uh, hospital administration. Actually, I left hospital administration in the 80s. I stopped being a hospital administrator in 1988. Um, I, I became, I should have said this already, I became a CEO, when I, I left Einstein, I went to a hospital in New York, um, in, in Queens, New York, uh, called Parkway Hospital, and I was there as the CEO to lead the turnaround of the hospital. And so I led that, I led that hospital turnaround. I turned it around in 18 months, and I left a year later because it was just not that much fun anymore. And and uh, that was that was a pretty cool experience. And what did I do next? Again, I'm, I apologize. I'm still back in the 80s. Um, is is I guess I should go back, right? No, not yet. But so in the, so I'm still in the 80s. And and what I did was the the. Uh, I enjoyed doing turnarounds so much that I went to work at Merrill Lynch's investment banking group. I worked on Wall Street. I worked across the street. I worked in the World Financial Center across from the Trade Center. I've been in the Trade Centers, the old ones, many, many, many times. Windows on the World, the whole nine yards, as I'm sure many of you have as well. Um, and that was more turnarounds in healthcare. And I, I worked for them for three years. I was a consultant for them for another three years. And, and that was a great personal, great experience. But again, turnarounds. So you're getting a the theme, right? But <coughs> that's, the whole, that's the whole idea here. In the in the nineties, um, I we we finished up with I finished up with with Merrill Lynch, did some consulting work for them for a while, and then I, I started working for a, a, a healthcare finance company and started financing startup businesses, healthcare businesses, and started working financing hospitals and other kinds of things. And I I learned an awful lot about about some business side of, of healthcare, um, and and uh, you know this is this is this is me. This guy here, yes, I used to have hair. You can see that, and it was darker. Wow. Um, this is me finishing the, uh, the, the 1991 uh, New York Marathon. Um, so that's kind of a uh, poignant picture. I've got, I've got other ones from the other ones, but certainly not worth going through. <coughs> um, and, and then the 2000s, and from a work standpoint, the company I was working for was acquired by Citicorp in May of 2000, and they wanted, to, and I was running a half a billion dollar healthcare finance business, and they wanted their own person to run it. And six months later, in October of, of 2000, uh, <coughs> I left with a very nice uh, place to sit, a nice cushion, and started a consulting business. And I've had a healthcare consulting business for the last 15 years. Obviously, I took some time off uh, from from doing uh, from working, uh, but I've started again, and uh, I've actually. Uh, done some work at the University of Pennsylvania Health System, doing some uh, business planning for them. And uh, but the, the but the 2000s started out pretty good. This is me finishing the the uh, Philadelphia Distance Run in 2002. So you know I continue to do what I like to do, um, and and so you can see what I kind of looked like. It wasn't so bad. I think I. I don't look all that bad now, either. Um, and th this was, we bought a bear up in the Poconos, back in the, back in, actually it was probably back in the 90s, but for some reason we were doing some pictures with my, it's my daughter when she was a bit younger. She was probably about 14 there, I guess, or 15. And but this bear had a heart on it. I don't know what. Why were we attracted to that bear? I don't know. And it's still in our backyard. It's kind of eaten up a little bit, but it's still there. Uh, and I'm kind of beaten up a little bit too, but that's okay. I'm still here. And in this, this is my finish time for the last uh, half marathon I ran. This was in 2009, ten months after I had my first pacemaker put in. In 2008, uh, this, the, the early summer of 2008, I was diagnosed with bradycardia, which is very low heart rate. I was normally around 60 um, because I was in good shape, kind of healthy guy and that sort of thing. But when you're, when you're cruising around 30 heartbeats a minute and 28 heartbeats a minute, that's not such a good thing. And so we went through a lot of back and forth with a with a series of electrophysiologists and I went outside the area for a consultation and the guy said you need it and so I had it done outside the area 
uh, in a little place in, in Baltimore that you've probably heard of called Johns Hopkins. And, and, but I was, was tracked here, uh, not, at, not at Penn, which is now where I am, but over in South Jersey. And, uh, but 10 months after I had my first uh, pacemaker put in, I ran a half marathon. And not a great time, but so what? I didn't care. Um, and then some more things started to, uh, to happen. So the, 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 this is the summer of 2011. And, and because between the time I had the heart, the, uh, the pacemaker put in, and the summer of 2011, things were fine. I ran a half marathon. We, our daughter graduated from, from high school in 2011. I turned 60. And we went on a trip to Italy. And so this is, this is a picture of Tuscany. But there's some other, other interesting things that, that occurred while we were in this, this trip to Italy. And this is, this is in Florence. And there is a, this is, he's, this is a mine, this is in this beautiful piazza in, in, in Florence. And you can see I got a, a little chubby here and a little chubby here, but, and, 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 but look at, this guy puts his hand on my chest and he's, he's got a heart. Now obviously this was sort of a love thing, but maybe not, I don't know. So, and there are a whole series of pictures like this, including with my wife. And, and, but I thought this was a, a, for me, this was a very poignant one. And, and, and because um, about a month after we got back, I was out for a I don't know, six mile run, and I started to get short of breath. So it was, you know, but it's still you know, the end of July. It was 90 something degrees, and the humidity was high. And I thought, well, you know, I, I'm not exactly a kid anymore, and so maybe I'm a little dehydrated, or maybe I have a little heat stroke, and I didn't think much of it. I drank a ton of water the rest of the day. I ended up feeling fine. The next day, I went out for a bike ride, and probably about a 15-mile bike ride or so, uh, and then the same sort of thing happened. I was like, but I didn't feel as good the rest of the day. I sort of took it easy, but I still drank a lot, and whatever. A couple of days later, I was fortunately, um, I had to go to the doctor's office and have my pacemaker interrogated. And they kind of freaked out because, now remember that I had my pacemaker because I had low heart rate. Well, all of a sudden, I don't have low heart rate. I have extraordinarily high heart rate. It's called ventricular tachycardia, VTAC. You've probably heard of it. And in my case, we're in the neighborhood of 250 beats or more a minute. I didn't really feel it. I was in pretty good shape. I didn't feel it. They flipped out. I ended up being admitted to the hospital over in South Jersey. And I got an upgrade, an equipment upgrade, from a pacemaker to a pacemaker to food wire. And so, I don't know, was there a relationship between me and this guy and having that happen? Clearly not. But, I don't know, kind of inter interesting. And so, this started me with, that's not the guy. This started me with a series of, of being at, at one hospital uh, over in South Jersey, having the upgrade done, going to cardiac rehab, um, and then trying to come back again. Still working, by the way. Uh, and then come, you know, trying to come back, and, 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 and you know, over the course of the next five, six months, I went skiing. Uh, I ran a 5K. Uh, I worked out with a personal trainer and all this other sort of stuff, and and things were pretty good um, un until until February of 2012. And February of 2012, I they they I had a wireless uh, pacemaker interrogation done, and the next day my phone rang at around noon, and I could see who it was, and I said to the guy I was having lunch with. I said, that's the cardiologist's office. I don't think this is going to be a good call. And they called and they, and they like, where are you? And I told them, they said, you need to get to the hospital now. Because we have detected that over the last two months, in the meantime, I was skiing in this two month period and working out and whatever. Over the last two months, you've had over 2,700 
episodes of ventricular tachycardia. Like, how could you still be here? Yeah. And and I'm like, I feel fine. Can I finish my turkey sandwich? Yeah, you probably should get in the car and and get here. And by the way, don't drive yourself here. Have somebody drive it. Because the last time I did it, I drove myself. So I ended up there, and it they did an ablation, and the it it didn't work. Um, and and what they detected during the ablation was not only didn't it work, but they said that you know where we were going through uh, up through the groin was into to the inside of your heart, and we were trying to deal with the electrical things going on there, and and uh, not only couldn't we control that, but we determined that you have it on the outside of your heart as well, and we don't do that procedure. There's really just one guy in the Philadelphia area that you really need to go see, and his name is David Cowens, and he's at a place on the other side of the river uh, called the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and thank God I went there. That, and, and so. Over the course of about two or three weeks, I spent a good couple of weeks or so in the hospital, um, over at Penn as well. And in that, in, in that time, at my, my, my time at Penn, they, um, Dave uh, did two sets of sets of ablations because they went back to the groin and they went through my chest to get to the outside of the heart, and it didn't work. And the, the, uh, he said, all right, I don't lose. Let's go, we're gonna do this one more time and let's see if we can get this to be controlled. But you need to go for an MRI. Well, as most of you, as all of you, most of you probably know, when you've got a, devices like that, MRI is not the, uh, the, uh, the screening device of choice, um, but MRI was the right thing. And so Penn is prepared, as many hospitals are these days, um, to work with someone with my, my, my issue because you gotta shut everything off. And, but a funny story is that Dave says to me, yeah, but the guy that's doing it, he's leaving tomorrow for a week, and so he's really booked. I don't think, he said, it doesn't look like they're going to be able to get in, and so we're going to have to delay things. You're going to have to stay here longer. Now, I'm on the gurney after the, after the ablation, um, you know, like flat on your back, and, and I had my cell phone with me, and I said, do you mind if I make a phone call? And he looked at me like, Seriously? I said, he said, okay. I called a friend of mine who at the time was the vice chairman of the Department of Radiology at Penn. Um, and, and we had been, once before, we had been business partners and we're, we've been very close friends since our kids started in kindergarten together. And I said, Kurt, this is Bob. So here, I'm here at Penn, here's why. I need to have this MRI done tomorrow and so-and-so is going on vacation, you need to call him and tell him that he can't leave. I need to get it done tomorrow. And you can't take no for an answer. And guess what? It was done the next day. And so I, the following, early part of the following week, I had another ablation, set of ablations on, still didn't work. And, and it, was, it was Dr. Callens who subsequent to that said, Maybe you have cardiac sarcoidosis. And of course, what's that? It's an autoimmune disease. Okay, how did I get that? It's idiopathic. Idiopathic means they have no clue as to how you get it if you didn't already know. And, and, and so it was ultimately confirmed within a couple of, uh, uh, several weeks anyway, uh, with a PET CT. And the, the uh, as I said, PET CT, confirmed it, and then they were putting a team together of people, uh, led by two, two folks, uh, one of whom I had already met, the other one I hadn't, uh, Lee Goldberg, who is uh, 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 one of the directors of the, of the Heart and uh, Transplant Center at Penn, who's a wonderful guy, and, and then a, a, a woman pulmonologist, uh, Jessica Dine, and because most patients that have sarcoidosis, it's typically in their lungs. And, and so though pulmonologists are the people with the most experience on how to deal with, with this. And so they were planning my treatment period. But, you know, they weren't, it, I was doing okay, so nobody was rushing to get it started. And then uh, apparently I decided uh, uh, that I wanted to speed things up because my 
defibrillator went off a few times. And I was admitted to uh, the hospital um, on uh, Friday morning before Mother's Day weekend of 2012. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, I think, I got there at 4 o'clock, whatever it was. Yeah, 4 o'clock. And then around 11 o'clock in the morning, at, um, I was visited by a, a, a very lovely uh, cardiologist, um, very prim, proper, uh, contemporary of mine, comes in with two fellows and closes the door, introduces herself. Uh, I know her name now. I couldn't have told you what it was then. And all she said was blah, 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 heart transplant, blah, blah, blah. And I went, what? <laughs> Excuse me? I said, no, who are you talking to? So I was a little more graphic than that, quite honestly, but um, way more graphic than that. And, and so uh, they evaluate, evaluated me that weekend uh, for a heart transplant. And on Monday, they said, you don't need a heart transplant, and they kicked me out. So I was there from Friday to Monday, and all weekend thinking, heart, heart transplant? What? Excuse me? I don't get it. The, the, uh, so I met with the transplant coordinator to call that, that day. Uh, they started testing that day um, through the weekend, and that worked out great. And I also, for the first time, met with pulmonologist Dr. Dine, and they started me on steroids right away. And, and, and uh, so I went on a treatment period of time that lasted about 10 months. But, uh, oh, I missed this. This is back in February. I spent, this is, we were in, when I was here in February, we, this was Valentine's Day. And you can see, there's, there's, these are gloves on the wall, and there's the window and the door. So this is, I was in bed, and my wife brought in a, a uh, to say, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, the real happy Valentine's Day. But I was there to deal with it, I guess. But, so I started on prednisone. And it, you guys that are familiar with the, the uh, uh, Rod <laughs> yeah, Serling, like uh, you know, you've now <laughs> crossed over into the prednisone. And, and you know, all of the side effects, I don't have to tell you, you guys have got it. And I'm still on prednisone, I'm on five milligrams a day, because it, for me, it, it does two things. It, it's the only thing that helps control the sarcoid, and my sarcoid is under control. It is in remission, I guess, is probably the right way to say that. Uh, and it also secondarily acts as my other anti-rejection drug. I only, I'm only on two things, so prednisone and, and tacrolimus, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, yes. who's, who, who's, who's here in the room and also ultimately watching this. And so, you know, this just started this really strange uh, period of time for me. And, you know, I became an insulin-dependent diabetic and I swelled up and all that wonderful stuff that, you know, I, oh, sleeping? Oh, what's that? Uh, you know, and, and uh, so, but eventually, over time, it, it, it came down. And, and uh, it came down in the treatment. And after about 10 or 11 months, the treatment was stopped because I, everything was under control. And then, so that took us into 2013. And, uh, and then not so much. And this is, this is 2013. Um, this, this, was, this is in the fall. My daughter is a, uh, uh, this, is, this is up in New York. And this is the sort of beginning of her junior year. And, and the summer was terrible um, for me. Um, I mean, you know, as you sensed, uh, I do a lot of running and all kinds of things. I'm a huge hiker. Uh, skier, et cetera, et cetera, all that sort of stuff. I couldn't do any of that. In fact, I couldn't walk from here to, that, to those double doors uh, where Susan's sitting um, without, without a lot, with probably not having to stop. And, and, but this was in a period of time um, in November where I was actually feeling pretty good. Right? Not look so bad. And, and uh, this was a Sunday. And this is, this is a little later that day when, I, when we left. Uh, my wife and I left to come back home, and I just gave her a hug. My wife took that, took that picture, which is uh, pretty poignant, um, because the next thing that happened was three days, four days later, my defibrillator went off in the middle of the night seven times. Uh, in the meantime, I'm being evaluated Oh, I had a, I had a, uh, uh, they changed out the, 
the, the I got a, I, I went from a, a, a one pacemaker defibrillator, they put in another one, and this was about a month later, and they start they had me on steroids again for a little while, and then they took me off of them, and it was just a crazy, crazy time. And but this was at the moment I was actually feeling pretty good. But four days later, the thing goes off in the middle of the night seven times. It did not work, by the way. Um, somehow I was able to get myself out of it. I can't. I mean, I was unconscious, so it's not something I, I you know, was aware of. And then and but we're in the middle of being evaluated for a transplant on an outpatient basis, and I had an appointment that day. So we went in early. We had the pacemaker check because they thought, well, it's only here a month old. You know, everybody gets a lemon from time to time, and, but no, it wasn't a lemon, it was a problem, and they, again, this is four days after this, and they said, no, and I was prepared, I brought a backpack with stuff, thinking I might be admitted, and they said, you're being admitted, and ultimately, they said to me within the next couple of days, uh, or actually later that day, and they said, you're not going home without a new heart. And I'll be honest with you, it took me more than two months to, after the transplant to figure out what that meant. Um, but, uh, so, I get admitted. And they put me on the transplant list. And then they get me upgraded to a 1AE that, the, the following day. Which is, so, so I get admitted on Thursday. Tuesday morning, I'm on the, I get put on the transplant list. They, they, they uh, reach out to the other nine hospitals in our region. They get me approved to become a 1A Wednesday night, and and uh, and you know we're hunkering in and thinking, all right, I'm gonna, we're going to be here, we're going to be living here at Hotel Hub uh, for the next six months, eight months, whatever. Uh, I'm an O positive, um, but I'm little, and that helped a lot. Um, which I wasn't happy when I was 15 and stopped growing. I was never happy after that about being little. Now it's okay, uh, and and so. Um, this this is so so that's Wednesday night I get upgraded to one day. This is Saturday night, and this is me dancing in the halls with my little IV of uh, lidocaine, which is the only thing that controlled things. Um, because we had just been told they found me a heart. So this is three this is three days later, and and that baseball hat. I didn't bring anything today. You'll see it later in some of the slides. That baseball hat I wear all the time. And, and uh, it, 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 you know, this was, this was that night. I mean, we had, we must have had 25 people at the hospital once we found out this was going to happen. Uh, my daughter, a bunch of her friends, uh, parents, relatives. All, I mean, it was, it was pretty <coughs> crazy. And the following morning I was transplanted and, and, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was tough. And, and uh, I don't remember anything from, really from being in the ICU uh, until I, and then I finally got it, uh, it uh, transferred from the, IC, from the SICU to the, uh, uh, to Silverstein 10, which is the intermediate care unit. And, you know, in the morning, that morning, you know, they ask you a question, like, you know, what's your name and blah, 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 you know, who's the president of the United States? And they said, what's your birthday? And I said, Oh, November 24th, 2013. You know, they're looking at my, it's like, yeah, no, that's not right. And they went, oh, then they realized what it was. And they said, oh, him, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And uh, this is actually me after, shortly after I came home. Somebody uh, uh, created a, a really nice, warm, black, I was freezing all the time. I still am, to some degree. But in a really wonderfully warm blanket, um, it has hearts all over. This is a really close close friend who actually used to take care of our daughter. Wonderful, wonderful thing. This is great. This this is uh, this next one. This is a, this is my first time out of the house uh, going for a walk. Um, now this is December. This is still December, but fortunately, I mean, it did get really cold into 2004 into 2000. And 14, but this was still 2013. It wasn't so bad, but appreciate that. Remember early on, I said I used to weigh like 185 mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. I was when I came home from the hospital, I was 124. Oh. I went down to 119. Ooh. And and I'm probably at 122, 123 here. Believe it or not, 
Here, right now, today, standing here, yeah, one, low 150s, which is about where I ought to be, more or less. So this is the first time, and yes, it's a walking stick. I, I didn't, it just, it helped. It wasn't a bad idea to have. <laughs> um, and, and so this was, this was pretty good. So things started to, I started getting better. I started, you know, I had home care, you know, physical therapy and occupational therapy. And, and started uh, and started cardiac rehab in, in February of, of uh, so about two and a half months into it, I started cardiac rehab and, and it took a while to get through that. This is a picture that was taken um, by a photographer because uh, I, I, I spoke at our synagogue in March of five, four months, five months after this, this, this thing. And, and they did a, the inquirer did a story on me in South Jersey. And so this is one of the pictures they took. You can see I'm wearing the orange hat, um, and of course I have the, the the heart here. And they had also taken pictures of me on my treadmill in the in the basement because I was doing that sort of thing already. And and but you can also see those see those cheeks are a little chubby, right? Well, I only weighed about 135 pounds at best there, and my face is thinner here, right? Well, what do you think that was? Ah, prednisone. There you go. So that. Uh, Kind of fun. Now, this is the uh, donor dash in April of, of 2014. Um, needless to say, I did that. And again, I'm wearing the orange hat. Huh? Um, I don't always wear it, but pretty much. And, and so uh, this was just a great experience. One thing I, I didn't mention to you earlier uh, was that when I worked at Einstein in North Philadelphia, um, I was one of the senior administrators there, and, and I was very involved with a, a physician named Dr. Aaron Bannett. And Aaron Bannett, uh, who was one of the founders of this organization, um, Aaron was a, a, a wonderfully aggressive surgeon uh, and character, uh, and he wanted to, to have a, a liver transplant program. So I worked together with him, we brought in some consultants and some other folks, and we put together Einstein's transplant program liver transplant program, and I met a guy named Howard Nathan. And, and uh, we didn't stay in touch all those years, but that day I went and introduced myself to Howard. And I've certainly rekindled that relationship with him, but uh, this, was, this was the VA. You can still see the cheeks were still a little bit on the chubby side. But, um, and, then, and then, like many of us, you go through, in that, for me, it, it was three times in the first eight months, or the first 10 months, um, I had a couple of what they like to call bumps in the road. The first one was I had a rejection back in, the, in December. Um, I, I had a, a, a biopsy, and there was a rejection, and they pumped me full of, of prednisone, and everything's been fine since then. I've got one more re, uh, biopsy scheduled in November, and hopefully that'll be my last one, it'll be my 20th. And the way the protocol is now is that there's no more unless there's a need for it. Um, but and then this is my second um, my second time of, of having a uh, a bump in the road. Uh, I had a, a reaction to um, the cumulative effects of of Celset, and it caused my white blood count to go through the floor. And I spent two weeks at Hotel Hub. Uh, actually 15 days to be precise, and we're sort of getting ready, to, this was in a day, or, a day or two of getting ready to leave, and my wife likes to post things on Facebook and let family know I'm sort of doing okay, so, and I was, I was doing, uh, I was kind of doing okay, so, so that was, no, that was another one, and, you know, I got shot, you know, they, they actually wanted to figure out why it happened, and they really, they still don't know really why it happened, 90, 95 percent of the time it's a good drug, negative accumulation of drug, and that's what they assumed. So they took me off of, of Celsef, which is why I'm only on two anti-rejection drugs now, and, and we changed a few other things up, and, and I got through it. And they swore that I was going to be positive for cytomegaly virus, CMG, because I was in that high-risk pool. I was someone that did not have CMV, but as a secondary gift of my donor, um, who had CMV, I now have CMV in me. And I tested negative, they must have tested it three or four times while I was there. Negative, 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 negative. Okay, that's great. 
Uh, however, <laughs> six weeks later, I tested positive for CMV, and I got a pick line in my arm, and I spent six weeks at home getting IVs, uh, IVs twice a day. My wife, thank God bless her, who is no nurse whatsoever, uh, learned how to to administer the IVs. My daughter learned it, all of my wife probably did 90 percent of it, and so that was my third um, that was my third bump in the road. And and uh, my pick line was taken out on August 13th. Um, I, we drove to our one our favorite place in the world, Vermont, uh, on the 15th, and on the 16th, uh, which was a Saturday, I I. I, I walked about I walked nine miles, and and uh, uh, it was it was great, um, and this is about a week and a half after that. Um, you can see the chubby cheeks are gone, the arms are still a little, a little thin, the legs were very thin. Although all of a sudden I did during this this two week trip to Vermont, all of a sudden my legs actually got muscles again. I so I noticed it one day in the shower. I mean, my legs, if, you, if I had been able to show you the full picture at the donor dash, I mean, my legs were sticks. And, and, but all of a sudden, I'm in the shower one day towards the end of this trip. And I, oh my God, I have muscles again. And, and uh, there was some definition. This is, um, and, you, and you can see, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm wearing the bracelet. And uh, I always have, the gift of life. And, and I always wear it. It, but this is, we are at the top of Mount Mansfield. You see, I don't always wear the orange hat, but, um, and the top of, I have, I have, I have, um, I have done the full hike of Mount Mansfield, which is the highest peak in Vermont, somewhere between 12 and 15 times. It's a six hour, six mile hike. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a most difficult, as they call it, it's the most difficult hike. And I've done it a bunch of times. But there is there's something called the toll road, and you can drive up the toll road, and you, it's about a mile and a half walk from where the toll road, where you can park, to the top of, of Mount Mansfield, where the where the uh, the chin is, and the chin's the highest point. And this is this is um, that same August. Um, this is this is about a, let's see, this is about two weeks, less than two weeks after I got the pick line taken out. I had I. Got enough strength back and enough resilience that we did the toll road walk. And it was tough. I almost didn't do it. I almost didn't make it. And my wife said, you got five more minutes. Get off your bike. And I said, okay. She said, you're going to be really mad at yourself if you don't do it. And she was right. And so I did it. And so this is me standing up there. And, and I'm thrilled. I am totally thrilled by being there. And, and still am. Um, in fact, we'll, we were in Vermont this past summer. I didn't do this walk, but we're going to do it. I did a whole bunch of other ones, but we're going we're going back in October, and I'll get it. I will be doing this one again, for sure. Not the whole hike. Maybe next summer. That's the goal. Next summer I'll do the whole thing again. When I get my Medicare card. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is last summer, last uh, falls of Philly Heart Walk. And uh, I was pretty involved with it, again, wearing the orange hat. Um, and that's myself and my daughter. And uh, my wife took a picture from behind. We're in we're early stages of doing the walk. And I was pretty involved with, with it. Last, um, uh, the folks at, at Penn, uh, somebody thought I had a bit of a personality, I guess, or whatever, or a story to tell. And so they actually profiled me on the, on the, on the heart and vascular web page uh, on Facebook. Uh, over a period of about five or six months, and they did a series of stories about about me, about us, I should say, uh, and and it all culminating towards pushing people, trying to drive people to come to the Philly Heart Walk. And I spoke at the Heart Walk along with uh, uh, a guy who you may have heard of, Derek Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. um, who is an incredible, incredible inspiration, uh, and I've become very good friends with him. What's TMF? Uh, <clears throat> TMF is is a uh, I can't actually I'll tell you after I this is off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and but it's 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 a it's tough. Um, and tough mother and. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Got it. 
He's a smart young man. Yeah, you got good. And and so um, I use that language. <laughs> I, guess that's I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, this was a this was a fun a fun day, um, and these two young ladies again. You see TMF again. Um, these two young ladies. These are these are nurses. Well, they they're not. Well, I'll explain both of them in a second. They're nurses from Silver Slime Ten, and they became very close friends of mine, and I'm still very close with them today. Um, and uh, this is Rachel, and uh, Rachel, unfor well, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for her, Rachel found a guy, and she moved with the guy to Pittsburgh, and hopefully she'll be back in another couple of years or so. Um, but she's just an incredible person. We spent many nights talking about talking about the healthcare business, which grounded me to be able to talk about things that were normal in my in my life. And and it was she was just she was just incredible and she's just a wonderful, wonderful young lady. And that's that and that, and that young lady with that incredible smile, that's Stephanie. And Stephanie, in, in, in the time between this, this picture and today, um, Stephanie has gone through a tough time. Um, Stephanie was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and, but I'm very, very proud and happy uh, to say that uh, it's now completely in remission, and she's going back to work uh, okay. very appropriately during the weekend of the Pope's, the Pope's Day. <laughs> so she'll she'll once again be a nurse on Silverstein 10, and uh, we went to a fundraiser um, for her, my wife and I, and I spoke at the fundraiser, and uh, the, both of these guys were here, plus a whole bunch of other young ladies and men who helped take care of me on Silverstein 10 as well. But incredible, incredible people, and I I owe so much to to, to both of them. Um, so they're important to me. Uh, crazy old me, yeah, that says Broad Street Run. Uh, I did the Broad Street Run in May. Um, I also, and, and, but the month before, no, two months before, I skied five days in Vermont. Like, real, not a whole day, but, you know, I did pretty good. And, but I did the Broad Street Run. I, I walked most of it, you know, I walked about seven to ten miles, but I ran about three. And, and my wife likes to do collages, but I'm sort of in, there in most of in all of these, except for the last one. I guess we're sort of in all of that. And and it was uh, it was great. This is probably about the fifth or sixth time I've done the Broad Street Run. I did, and, and but I hadn't done it in a while, as you might imagine. Uh, but so that was pretty cool. Uh, and like I said, I did skiing, which I guess I should have I should have reversed these. Um, and this is Mount Mansfield. That's the top of Mount Mansfield. I mean, that's, I've been to the top. I've never skied from there, but I've been to the top a bunch of times. And I actually, my consulting firm is called the Mansfield because of that. So, um, so this is one of the pictures I took from one of the ski slopes where we ski, um, which is near there. Uh, and, you know, I was here for my daughter's graduation from college. I mean, come on. You know, this is like I started. You know, it's for these two. This is the. This was such an incredible day. How how this kid got through school? Because she's got a bunch of friends that are super seniors. How she got through school in four years, dealing with grown sets of issues of you know going to college and being away and all that other fun stuff. And oh yeah, by the way, your dad got a pacemaker. Upgrade and the oh and a transplant. How she got through in four years is beyond me, but she did. She takes after her mother, I guess. Um, and so this this was just an incredible, incredible day, and, uh, and continues to be. So these are these are these are important times for us. Um, you might figure out this is me on an airplane. This is my first airplane trip to. Right, you can appreciate that. Yeah, there. The mask. Oh, yeah. This is my first airplane trip. We went to a, we went to Scotland, Ireland, and then London. Uh, I was away for for a little over two weeks. Probably a little too long, truthfully, for the first trip, but it was great. 
it was really uh, wonderful getting away and, and uh, it was pretty cool. And I can tell you that, that, that my pen uh, medicine website, that, 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 that works because I got sick while we were away. And one of our friends, uh, who's a doctor, she lives in Wisconsin, she was, we were together, and she brings a medicine cabinet with her. Not for me, for herself and her family. And she had some antibiotics. I got sick, I needed antibiotics. She had the antibiotics that I needed. I communicated with the folks at, at Hub through my pen medicine, and they said, oh, absolutely, take that stuff. And I was fine within a couple of days or so. And, and one really funny experience, we were in um, Kilkenny uh, in, in Ireland, and we were, we, we, we were, we were looking for, and, and, and found a couple of them, fortunately. We, were looking, we wanted to go to a pub where they were singing, you know, it was, it's, it's kind of the tradition, right? And so someone told us about a place called Hole in the Wall. And a Hole in the Wall is literally a hole in the wall kind of a place. It's in a building that dates back to the late 1500s. And, and uh, there's two little holes in the wall. One has the bar and a couple of seats, and one has a few other seats, and then they have an upstairs where they're singing and stuff. And we go in, and, and we're hanging out, and we're talking to the owner a little bit, and you know, and he's tending the bar, and he's doing all this other sort of stuff. He's a cardiologist. <laughs> he's an interventional cardiologist at one of the hospitals in Dublin during the day, and, but at night he owns and runs this, this, this bar. And so I said to him, so, Michael, how many, uh, how many heart transplant patient people have you had as customers? He said, I think you're my first. So he pulls out, he has his sign-in book that he has people sign from time to time. So I, I signed this book, and I'll never, for, I'll never forget it. It was just a, just a really wonderful, wonderful, funny coincidence. And, and uh, you know, this is in uh, Edinburgh, in, uh, in Scotland. And it's, it's, this is the, on the street. It's just this heart on the street. So, to end things, here's some of the stuff I'm involved with with giving back. Obviously, TRIO, and most, for sure. I'm involved with some activities, and uh, modestly, but some. Here, Gift of Life. Um, I'm pretty involved with the Heart Association in South Jersey. Um, in, in both their Heart Walk and I'm on their Government Relations Committee. I helped to get last, not this past summer, the summer before, we helped to get legislation passed requiring that high school graduates, um, before they can become graduates, have to be CPR trained. And I'm proud to say that. That was our number, we were number 19 uh, in terms of the states that have agreed to that. And I think, we, I just read yesterday, somewhere in the Midwest, upper Midwest, maybe North Dakota, just became 25. So we're halfway there. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. Um, I am involved in having nothing to do with heart, trans heart transplants. I'm involved with an organization called Jewish Healthcare International, and it's part of the, uh, the Jewish Agency, and a, and, an or and, a, and a program they have called Project 10. Um, and 10 is giving back, is sort of what the phrase means in, in, in Hebrew. And, and it's, uh, they have identified uh, five different uh, impoverished uh, uh, places around, where people live around the world, and, and they work with them to bring agriculture and, and other kinds of things. And I'm working with a group of, I'm the only one on the, on the board who's not a doctor. I'm working with a group of doctors from around the country, mostly, mostly here in the Northeast. Um, and what we're doing is we're bringing uh, some much needed healthcare services to these areas. And, and there's some, we, we, we just had a mission in, um, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in southern Mexico in a jungle. And I said, I'm not going. <laughs> but they're, they're involved, but um, the Jewish agency in, uh, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in, in Mexico called Cadena uh, has a hospital in Mexico City, I think, and apparently they're in need of some, uh, some maybe some turnaround support. So I, I may be going to Mexico to do some work. Uh, and I'm OK being in Mexico City. I think so. I'm involved with that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm as is as is my good friend Jim, um, the Hospital University of Pennsylvania's uh, Patient Family Advisory Council, uh, and and that's that's been very rewarding, uh, for sure. And I guess because of my healthcare business background, and because I've kind of gone through this little 
patient experience. This guy said, maybe, maybe you should be interested in being involved with um, the United Network for uh, uh, or Orange, um, the UNOS program um, in their Membership and Professional Standards Committee. And so he got me sucked into that pretty easily, um, which I did readily. When he said to me, would you like to do it, how long did it take me for me to say yes? Half a second. Right. And so, so I started uh, my involvement with that this past, officially anyway, on July 1st. It started really before that. And so I've now been to Chicago a couple times for meetings, and, and I've done a bunch of other things, and I, I keep getting these, these things to review, these uh, cases to review and things. And so that's, that's been very, very rewarding as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I actually have started to, so I am working again a little bit anyway, and would like to work more. Cause be truthful, there's no reason why I can't. And so that's my my journey. Great journey. Very nice. Fantastic. So what questions would you have for Bob with that interesting background and his life journey? What kind of thoughts? How, are you, how is your doctor reacting to uh, the risk of Lyme disease with hiking? Um, I, I take the appropriate precautions, but Really, none. No one has said. I mean, they know that I go to Vermont and that sort of thing. That yeah. the the concerns have really been focused more on not going into a lake. Okay. Um, and so, that being said, since I'm pretty far out, yeah. uh, uh, pretty far along, I'm a little far out too, I suppose. But um, <laughs> last summer, yeah. they said lake, Nishki, right. not at all. Yeah. Um, this summer I said, hey look, are you okay if I like do some kayaking and you know whatever and you know I may get my you know I may have you know maybe I'll go up to you know my knees or something or whatever. And they're like, yeah, as long as as long as you you know wash everything down and you're not really like going in swimming. So when we were there a few weeks ago, um, yeah, I did some kayaking in, in a lake and I actually did you know what paddle boarding is? Yes. We stand up on the board and you do that. So I, I was doing that and no, I didn't fall in, um, and and I had my balance, so that was even better. So that was really the only thing we didn't talk about. T I I am concerned about Lyme disease and yeah, because you know the treatment is high dose antibiotic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm from it. So when I when we do go hiking, that's really the, the, my wife and I went uh, for a hike in South Jersey. Yeah. Or a walk, I should say, really uh, last weekend, and when we kind of got there, and, you know, I said. I asked the, the folks at the forest, the state forest, the Wharton State Forest. I said, "What's what's the status of of, uh, of ticks these days?" Yeah. And they said it's actually really pretty well. That, but but I did some hiking back in the, in the, in the, in the spring, oh, yeah. and and I had you know I, I had I tucked my pants into my socks and you know wore gloves and all that and long sleeves and the whole nine yards and. And, and I immediately check to see what's there. So I, I watch for it. Um, yeah. And so I've really never had a conversation with them about it. Okay. You're still on prednisone? I'm still on prednisone, five milligrams a day. But you're not experiencing it. No. Well, that's a pretty low dosage. It's yeah. a pretty low dosage. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not experiencing that. And I'd say the only thing I'm experiencing, and, and arguably it's also because of the tacrolimus, is I still do a little bit of shaking from time to time. A little bit of the tremors, well, but not much. Prednisone, tacrolimus, and uh, mycophenolate. And one of them is giving me this and this. My wife claims it's my eating habits, you know. Mm. She'll always attack me on that, but she might be right. That's the, that's the prednisone. I've been on, I've been on high dose prednisone do for a long time, for, for extended periods. How much more? I'm not anymore, but I've been through two periods where I've been as high as 80 milligrams every other day and daily. Well, what, what are you on now? Now I'm only on five, but before my transplant, way back, they had me, when I had eye issues from the other experimental drugs, they had me on 80. Yeah. That, I, I, I never was at, at 80. I was at 60. Yeah. I mean, different when you go through surgery and when I had the rejection, but but on a normal basis, the highest that, I was ever on was 60. That actually put... 26 pounds on me in 25 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, just was awful. That's about right. Awful. I did 30 in two yeah, weeks. Couldn't get my feet into my shoes. 
Yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I could, I didn't show other pictures, but I have other ones where. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm still getting, you know, side effects from one of the three yeah. drugs, but you know, I'm feeling great. So. Well, one better. or more, actually. I mean, one of the one side effect I actually had was when I was, oh, probably 56 or 57. You know, I went to see the ophthalmologist and. And he said, oh, you know, I can see there's some cataracts forming all the way in the back, so maybe in your late 60s or so, we'll have to deal with that. Now, this I was a kid who, who I, I wore glasses from the time I was seven years old until I had cataract surgery, which was not long before I had the transplant, actually. And, and between being diabetic, being on insulin, being on prednisone, whatever, all, any one of those things could hasten the development of cataracts. All three, you know, you're in, uh, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, so I had cataract surgery, and now I wear, for the most part, I basically wear reading glasses. Yeah. Yeah, I had the cataract, and uh, <clears throat> the anesthesiologist, after my transplant, came in the room, and he's got his check board, he's going through everything, and he stops, and he looks, looks at my file, and he said, given what you've been through, this is nonsense, I'll see you later. Right. Don't really worry about it. And the cataract was nothing. You know, the right procedure is, it's unbelievable. That was out, I mean, my yeah. kids were outpatient. Yeah, I'm sure it's it's incredible. Yeah, you get rid of your glasses. Yeah, same, yeah. same thing. Yeah, same. All the drugs I had are, you know, early cataracts. Yeah. And wore, you know, glasses since first grade. And, and I yeah. wear reading glasses. But it's all like, worth it. Yeah. I mean, pred prednisone basically is going to give you a chipmunk face. Yeah. It's going to look like you're walking around like a chipmunk with nuts in your mouth. Um, and it puts, and you, and you do put on weight. Oh, yeah. But not, but you don't look like, back when I was first transplanted, it was easier to look at somebody in a, in a group where you, there are known transplants, a, a party, a, a gift of life, a function, a gift yeah. of life. You could almost spot, you know, yeah, 17 all, years ago, transplant, transplant, yeah. you know, transplant because of the cheeks. Yeah. I, I can't tell anymore. I, I, I don't see the, you know, the immediate, Post surgery, yeah, you see it because yes. sure, of all yeah. the drugs. But I, you know, I mean, this well, is I think not over time too. The <clears throat> protocols have changed, which yeah. they try to do lesser and lesser and lesser volumes of the drugs that you take because they're trying to find where you don't need them to not have rejection yeah. but without being as toxic. Right. Um, yeah, I, yeah and I, I just figure I take so many drugs now that. You know, some make your hair grow, some make you lose hair, some yeah, give you diarrhea, hair some <laughs> make you stopped up. They, you mix them all together and there's no, there's no, there's no side effects. a bunch of body hair, some of which is coming back. I mean, I was already balding, as you saw from the, or one of the early pictures, but um, it, it really hasn't been a big deal. They Actually, had me on psychoscore, <clears throat> yeah. about your body hair, and they all kind of warnings that you're going to experience hair growth, hair growth. Oh you yeah. Electric razor, you can cut yourself because your growth is going to be like very wiry and you're going to get hair growth in many places in your body. My life, not on my head. Everywhere <laughs> else. You know, well, psych Psychosporine is, I spent two years, three years on it, it's body hair. I reached a point where I had to literally shave the backs of my hands because otherwise I looked like I had mittens. Yeah. I, and I said, yeah. nothing here though. Yeah. Nothing tragically. It doesn't matter. It's, it's all it's all body hair. Yeah. I mean, I went over, I went a year with cyclophosphamide, and that's the reverse. All of this falls out. I woke up one morning and I went, why is there hair all over my keyboard on my computer? And I said, oh, I'm shedding. Yeah, I think the only reaction to my face, for the most part, was after the transplant was, you don't look white anymore, you actually have color. Yes. Yeah. You have, there's, and it's like, well, yeah, it's because my heart now works and there's blood pumping through my yeah. body. Absolutely right. Yeah. And with the kidney, I don't know if you experienced it, I certainly did. I had a look like this, a like a white look, pallor, yeah. and um, I looked like I expired two days before. It was the first thing my mom, I remember, in ICU, you know, immediately post transplant surgery was the first thing my mother said. You've got color. Yeah, and everybody that sees me, wow, look at you. And I said, because everything is working. Mm -hmm. And what about the body? I used to get up every from every seat, holding my back, my knees, 
I don't have any aches and pains anymore because the toxicity is gone. Because I had a chiropractor that was treating me twice a week, I was in such discomfort. And finally he said to me, and they're, they're holistic, they're not, you know, like regular MD, and he said, if something can be done about that kidney, you're going to have a whole different life. And I said, how's that? He said, it's just affecting, you know, all your muscles. He took me through the whole medical parameters. And he was right. Right after the transplant, I got up out of bed and I walked. I said, where's the back ache? Where's the knees? <laughs> never, never presented itself again. And one thing I would tell anyone who's, who's especially a talent high dose pregnancy, but anyone heading that direction in terms of kidney transplants, because all the way sat here by a recliner, trust me, it takes all the pressure, yeah. you know, it, it allows you to lie down comfortably. I tend to decide up to that. I have a comment. Well, two comments. One, I, I looked up online your disease because I, I had never heard of it before and I was like... You're, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, he's lucky to be alive given mm -hmm. what I read briefly here. Yeah, mo most people when they have sarcoidosis, um, they don't find out, well actually they never find out about it because you right. find out about it post-mortem. And I didn't think that was a good option. <laughs> right. And so that, you know, but my That's why I think David Cowan is every day. Yes. I mean, everybody says, you know, what first thing I do in the morning is I thank my donor. Well, obviously I'm extraordinarily grateful. And, and yes. yes, I've written to my donor, and no, I haven't heard anything back. But of course I am. But it, if it wasn't for David Callens, who said, I think you have this stuff, is that still on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Never mind. I won't say what I actually said to him. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but if it wasn't if it wasn't for him, I absolutely wouldn't be. Absolutely, I. Yeah. And and uh, it's because of that. The other thing that's really a little interesting about sarcoidosis is that it typically strikes uh, forty-year-old African American women in their lungs. So for you, it was even more unusual. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like sarcoidosis is that. Yeah. The population gets it is like that, and the population gets cardiac only like that. So, yeah, it's it's uh, I'm I'm so incredibly lucky. Well, and 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 that's you know what, that's you know it's like that's why I do this stuff because I remember the, the transplant was Sunday. You know, I got taken Silver Sun Town on Friday. Saturday, my wife and I were together. It was just the two of us, and I said. I don't know why I got so lucky and you know so quickly and you know I said all I know is we need to do something about this. I don't know what, mm -hmm. but we need to do something about this. And I and, and I've also said to myself on many occasions is, you know, even though I, I know there's a reason for everything and, 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 and you know I, again I can I've recounted some of that like you know why did you know these heart attacks that my family had led me to try to live a different life ultimately and, right. and, and, and be a runner and all that stuff. Never had a heart attack. You know, I did all the things you're supposed to do except somehow I got sarcoidosis. So that means there's, there's a, but there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what that reason is. I don't know what I'm supposed to, to, to be here for. Um, but there's more meaning to it than, 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 than all of this. I don't know what it is. And I'm going to just keep on my journey looking for it. Because there's a reason. And, I, and, and I'm going to just keep doing these things. And maybe it's these things. I don't know. But I think that somehow I think there's more to it than that. I don't know what it is, but I think there's more. Well, I have my own philosophy behind that. I don't think anything is luck. I think <clears throat> there's a plan determined for each and every one of us the moment we're born. And I think that the reason you got transplanted was so that you could do all these things because you have the skills and abilities to help so many people by doing all of these things. But more importantly, as the donor family in the audience, I just want to say that when I hear a presentation like yours, I'm truly inspired that it was the right decision to make as a family to, to donate because there are a lot of people out there doing a lot of amazing things after they're transplanted. And <coughs> Um, giving back in ways that you've been able to help so many people because you got that gift. And that's really life-changing for me because it's a reminder to me 
that we did the right thing. And I couldn't help but having tears when I saw the picture of your daughter's graduation because to be able to, to be there for those milestones is a truly amazing. And the next picture and, will be when she gets a job. <laughs> yeah, but it's truly amazing and it's very rewarding for me to see that, to know that your journey continues because of the gifts that not just my son gave, but so many donors gave to people that your journey continues. And so I appreciate that you shared that in your presentation. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, we always conclude our talks by saying thank you with a little book. This is a 365 days of inspiration. You provide a lot of inspiration for us here today. And uh, we thank you for that. Uh, Bob and I drove up to the Region 2 Education Forum on Thursday up in Newark and heard some amazing presentations. There's really some uh, game-changing technology coming into play in the in vivo uh, perfusion of lungs and even maybe hearts and livers uh, at the rate it's going. But it was kind of interesting because one of the speakers from St. Barnabas uh, cardiology, as I recall, uh, and after he got through with a very interesting presentation, I asked him if he'd mind if we put an exclamation point at the end of his presentation to this gathered audience of about 80 medical professionals and OPO staff. And he said, sure, go ahead. And I said, this is Bob. He's out 21 months from his heart transplant. And I'm Jim, and I'm out 21 years from my heart transplant. And he had been presenting graphs of survival rates and some <clears throat> that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it really added a whole different dimension to what he said. And uh, he turned to both of us and he said, I just have to point out, these guys are doing well because they're so compliant. And I guess if there's a message uh, that we want to leave the audience uh, around the country who are going to see your presentation through this, it would be, you know, it's really worth the troubles and the bumps in the road to go through because of the engagement we have with our family, our loved ones, etc. And paying back becomes a very important part of the transplant journey. And be compliant. And you can maybe run <laughs> half marathons, whole marathons, climb mountains, <laughs> ski, etc., etc. Uh, if your knees hold up. And not everyone's as crazy as I am. Right. Bob, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you.